it's really kind of overwhelming to look out and see so many faces. Like, really, it's kind of like a this is your life kind of moment. Because um, I, I came first to WRT in 1992. I was a sophomore in college. I was doing a song leading gig. I think some of my first confirmation students are right in the back, which is kind of amazing. But through this congregation are people who have raised me since I was really a kid, who watched me get married and go to college. You fed me. Um, there's a whole crew over here with whom I raised my children for the first few years here in Scarsdale. Of course, my own family and, and friends from so, and new faces as well. And I, it's just so wonderful to be back in what I consider also my home. I'm going to um, try to be coherent because I have to admit that I'm relatively jet lagged. I woke up this morning at the equivalent of 3 a.m. and I landed from Israel this morning. And I was with um, a group of rabbis here on a, uh, that went to Israel on a UJA mission. Um, rabbis from Brooklyn to Westchester, Orthodox to Reform, there to show Jewish solidarity, to offer support, and to bear witness to the stories, and I want to bring a few of them back to you. We met with hostage families as well, who shared the indescribable torture of their own imaginations, of waiting, of not knowing. We are on day 28, and one mother wears the number on her body every day. She also shared her gratitude of how even within the first few hours when people realized that her son was missing, her home was turned into a makeshift situation room filled not only with family and friends, but even people she barely knew who had special skills to help her in this situation, her and her husband, and have been by their side ever since. We visited with evacuees from the north and from the south. There are over 200,000 people who are displaced within Israel. A lot has 60,000 refugees. Jerusalem, 35,000. A survivor from Kibbutz Kitiv told us of her desperation on October 7th when she hid with her family in a safe room and because none of them lock from the inside out, she held the handle for 10 hours waiting for the IDF to come and they didn't come. She said, I can't believe I'm now a refugee in my own country. Evacuees fled their homes with no clothing, not even a toothbrush. Now they've been living in hotels and in empty apartments or with family all around the country for almost a month. At the Dead Sea, which is usually a sort of sleepy tourist destination with only about 1,000 residents, there's now a new temporary city that has sprung up with about 15,000 evacuees. We met in a hotel, a hotel that has 900 evacuees from Kibbutz Be'eri. When you walk into the hotel, you see a makeshift altar filled with candles for the 90 members of the kibbutz that were killed on October 7th. And then you see um, a wall with 30 pictures of the 30 captives all taken from that kibbutz, ages 2 to 78. And yet amidst this tragedy, you also heard gratitude for the hundreds of volunteers who have come around the clock to this makeshift refugee city to help, social workers, trauma therapists, yoga teachers, massage therapists, all offering their, their services, some of them just moving into the area to provide these services every single day. A master educator moved to the Dead Sea, and within five days he had set up 17 makeshift schools, one for each kibbutz and they, he even recruited some of the very best principals from around the country to run these schools. I sat with another mother who has three members of her family in captivity. Noam introduced me to her eight-year-old daughter whose name was Be'eri, and she smiled ruefully, saying, I guess I'm a trendsetter with the name. And I was confused. Kibbutz Be'eri was one of the most devastated on October 7th. It's a name that's associated with a great deal of pain, but she told me that five babies born in the last three weeks have been given the name Be'eri. An act that so symbolizes the defiant spirit of Israelis to reclaim that name, which means my wellspring, as a source of new life 
and hope in this parched landscape. We visited the home of Daron Peretz in a yeshuv outside Jerusalem. Daron's son, Yonatan, is a soldier who was shot in the leg on October 7th. His second son was commanding a tank, and he is now in captivity. Yonatan was supposed to get married the week after the attack, and the family was so torn about whether or not they could carry on with the wedding with their missing son, their missing brother. But they proceeded with the wedding as a spiritual call to arms that they must continue to choose life. So we sat with Daron and his son and his daughter in their yard, Yonatan, now a newlywed, but dressed in his army uniform with his gun on his back, about to go back to his base. And his father explained that Yonatan is actually exempt from serving in the army now because his brother is in captivity. The IDF doesn't want to add that additional emotional strain to the family. Through tears, Daron said proudly, my son came to me and said, I had to sign the waiver to let him go back. And I said to him, I didn't want him to go. And my son said, you're responding like a father, but this is the son you raised me to be, to go and protect our country. The Israel that I saw this week is a different country. It will never be the same. October 7th wasn't just the most atrocious act on Israeli soil in its history. It was a watershed moment that changed the, his, the country's conception of itself. Micha Goodman, who was our first speaker on the trip, he helped frame how we might understand what this moment was for this country. He reminded us that on October 6th, the day before the attacks, Israel was in an internal civil war. Ten months of nonstop protesting was just that outward expression of a political and cultural divide that was tearing the country apart. He explained that Israel was falling prey to the curse of the eighth decade. Now you see, if you don't know what the curse of the eighth decade is, Jews have only had sovereignty over ourselves two other times in Jewish history. The first Jewish state, established by King David 3,000 years ago, and the Hasmonean dynasty of the Second Temple period. In both cases, internal strife, that's Jew against Jew, precipitated our downfall in the eighth decade. We were granted one more opportunity at sovereignty when the state of Israel was founded in 1948, but you can do the math. Israel's in its eighth decade. Up until October 6th, it seemed that the internal divisions of the eighth decade might tear the country apart. What is it about the eighth decade? Micha explained that while the first generation is acutely aware of the great responsibilities and privileges of having a state and a nation, and the second learns from their parents and appreciates what the previous generation lived through without a state, when you get to the third generation, they take the existence of the state for granted, become more wedded to their own individual needs and less willing to sacrifice for the good of the whole. So, Micha said that on October 7th, for the 12 longest hours of their life, Israelis felt like what it was like to not have an army, to not have a functioning government. In essence, what it feels like to not have a state. He said October 7th effectively created a whole new foundational first generation who will never take for granted again what it is to have sovereignty who are going to be willing now to make great concessions and sacrifices for the good of the country, to unify under one banner, like the one we saw everywhere around the country, Bayachad nitnatseach, together we will prevail. So that realization and understanding of what it's like not to have a state created this generation which will form a new Israel. And we already see it being birthed. It's too early to say exactly what this new Israel will be, 
but we saw glimpses of the incredible generosity and courage, ingenuity and resilience and spiritual defiance that will shape the new Israel. Now I cannot help but note that on this 70th anniversary of Westchester Reform Temple, you are entering your eighth decade. <laughs> don't worry, I don't think you're cursed. But you are in the third generation of this community, so to speak, and it begs the question, have you taken for granted what it means to have this incredible community? I first arrived at WRT, as I said, as a college song leader doing gigs for confirmation. It was more than 30 years ago, and I didn't take it for granted because I came from Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> I felt like a pioneer in a strange new Jewish landscape. From where I came from, there was only one synagogue for 30 miles. There were only three Jews in my high school. One of them was my sister. Another one, <laughs> another one was my friend Hillary. There wasn't a single Jewish boy to date. Okay, so I remember I had to fight to get student body elections off of Yom Kippur and you couldn't find challah in a single grocery store. It didn't exist. If you wanted food for Passover, you ordered it through the temple's sisterhood and you picked up a big box of matzah and gefilte fish jars. Now, when I arrived in Scarsdale, I had never seen so many Jews. <laughs> I couldn't believe that the public schools gave the Jewish holidays off. On Passover, there were aisles and aisles of kosher for Passover food. I remember that Cantor Merkel would give Yiddish concerts and the entire audience was singing along with all the words. I had entered into some kind of Jewish cultural nirvana. <laughs> Even 30 years ago, I'm not sure you all appreciated what a marvelous Jewish joyful bubble this was. I remember asking a student in my sixth grade class, what percentage of Jews make up America? And he said, 50%. <laughs> When I told him it was actually around 2%, the whole class was incredulous and professed that they would never believe another word I said again. <laughs> now, I know you all loved your clergy, but I don't know that you fully appreciated that you were led by the giants of every generation, starting with the legendary Rabbi Jack Stern, then my beloved mentor, and now president of us all, Rabbi Rick Jacobs and his family. And today, my dear friend and classmate, the brilliant Rabbi Jonathan Blake, in partnership with the gifted, the gifted cantor Amanda Kleinman, and a roster of stellar cantors and rabbis all the way down the line. I am so deeply honored that I got to be among the many clergy who grew up here and learned how to become a leader of the Jewish people from this sacred congregation. As you enter your eighth decade, you might have taken your Jewish life here for granted, but I imagine that the events of October 7th and the subsequent responses here in America have changed all of us. We are shocked by the anti-Semitic hate, the bullying and intimidation of Jews happening on our campuses, in workplaces, on social media. We're chilled by the silence or the contextualizing that even moral leaders who we relied upon from university presidents to other faith leaders have been quiet on. And we feel for the first time in my lifetime less safe as Jews in America. All of this as we worry about keeping our own humanity and moral clarity in a time of great darkness and fear and war. Perhaps this watershed moment in our own American Jewish community will ensure that our Jewish community, that this congregation does not fall into the complacency that can befall us in the eighth decade. If you took Westchester Reformed Temple for granted before, I hope that you will no longer.
This congregation will be your Jewish home base as you navigate these turbulent waters together. WRT and your clergy and each one of you will be guides for each other to find your most generous, selfless, and courageous Jewish selves. I know this because I've already seen the way it has. And I want to share just by example one story about my niece, Emily. First, I have to start by saying that Jacob and I begged his sister Sarah and Andrew to move to Scarsdale when we lived here. And they said, oh, no, no, it's a little too fancy for us. And then a year after we left, they moved in about a mile from where we lived in Edgewood. And then, of course, they joined WRT and have become deeply involved. And then they joined Sharing Shabbat, which is the gem of a family Shabbat community that helped raise Emily to be an engaged, knowledgeable, and proud Jew. Emily, I will say proudly, is now co-president of the Jewish Culture Club at Scarsdale High School. And after October 7th, when tensions were very high and harsh words were flying, and we saw the way that this just deteriorated in schools, high schools, and colleges all around the country, she wanted to build bridges, not burn them. And I love that her first thought was, I have to call Rabbi Blake. That says so much about you. Because she also has a, another rabbi in the family. <laughs> but okay, that's okay. I'm really glad she called you. And in her email, thinking about next steps, she also copied the head of the Muslim Culture Club at Scarsdale High School so that the groups could help support each other and not tear each other apart. This week, the Jewish and Muslim Student Culture Clubs did a joint fundraiser for humanitarian aid, both for Israel and for Gaza. I am immensely proud of my niece, but much of the credit goes to this Westchester Reformed Temple community. She acted as the confident, compassionate, thoughtful and proud Jew that you raised her to be. Biyachad, nitnatseach, together we will prevail, not just on the battleground in Israel, but in this complex and painful time here. Westchester Reform Temple, happy 70th anniversary. As you enter into this eighth decade, renewed in your sense of purpose, May you continue to lead the way for our country's Jewish community. May you give strength and support to this incredible clergy team who serves our Jewish people with such intelligence and such heart. And may you support each other in the work of building sacred community as you have done so powerfully and so beautifully over the last 70 years. I know this is not an easy time, so I want to end with blessing. I'm going to take our tradition's oldest blessing, but give you one of our newest arrangements of it. Thank you. This is a version of the Priestly Benediction by Alana Arian, a beautiful songwriter that I know. And she takes that threefold benediction May God bless you and keep you. May God be gracious to you and shine light upon you. May you feel a sense of wholeness and peace. So, but that was the Hebrew. Uh, now I'm going to do uh, your interpretive blessing. So, first... I want to offer this priestly benediction, this oldest blessing we have for each one of you who have made this holy congregation what it is now and over the decades. May you feel safe. May you song. Can you hear that song? May you find
offer this prayer together for our brothers and sisters in Israel, for all those who are held captive in dark places. Let's offer this blessing and prayer to them. For those who are on the front lines protecting our beloved country in Israel, for the innocents who are caught in the crossfires of this war. May you feel safe. May you be someone that you love that's close to you and they just need a little extra strength and comfort and peace right now or perhaps you can imagine the person you don't know as well who you imagine needs this prayer or maybe someone that you actually have a hard time loving but you want to offer them this prayer because the world just needs a little bit more peace and a little more love may you feel sad love your neighbor as yourself but what if you're not loving yourself well if you're not able to give this blessing to yourself we're so busy taking care of everyone else but we actually understand that we're not really able to love more than we can give that love to ourselves in this moment and we need to nourish and take care of our spirits in this time where it's so easy to despair so if you can close your eyes and just uh, allow yourself to offer this blessing to each one of us. May I feel safe. May I be them this line and then turn to someone else and offer this line and let's bless each other this holy congregation may you feel safe may you be safe 